late 19th and early 20th century uh, was a difficult time for Chinese Australians. Racism was endemic in Australia. There were laws affecting um, Chinese, non-Europeans that pertain to almost every aspect of life. And of course, uh, in the early 20th century, you could not become a member of the armed forces. The general attitude was one where you had to fight for acceptance. You know, the white Australia policy was really starting to work. You couldn't be naturalised. You couldn't bring your wife and children here. Um, and so there was no point, in a sense, if you're a young man, in being Chinese in a country town. And so if you wanted to get on in life, you had to be Australian. Hedley Tongway was my grandfather and Samuel Tongway was his older brother, both of whom were um, Chinese Anzacs. Samuel worked very, very hard to gain acceptance um, and he really, um, to some extent, turned his back on his own um, cultural heritage um, he never learnt to speak Chinese um, and he was encouraged, of course, by the parents to speak English well. My great-grandfather was Chinese, James Huey. He married Annie Evans in 1871. They had 11 children and three of those children uh, enlisted in the First World War up until 13 years ago. We didn't know anything about the Chinese link. We thought we had a Welsh link with the name Hughes. In lots of photos of Welsh Hughes things when we visited Wales, which have now all been destroyed, of course, <laughs> because we're not Welsh. What happened in the, just after 1900 when the eldest son married was the first time that the name Hughes appeared on any formal certificates or information. And it appeared at about that time, a number of the children started to use the name Hughes. So they're all born a Huey, and some of them died a Hughes. I didn't know that I had Chinese ancestry, even though it probably should have been apparent to me by looking at my dad. Um, I didn't know my grandmother, but nobody ever talked about it. So, you know, I, I, it was a big surprise to me. Uh, my father was a high school teacher in Toowoomba. He taught Latin, Geometry and Algebra and was very well known in Toowoomba. Everyone seemed to know him. He didn't seem to acknowledge his Chinese ancestry very much, but as he grew up, his father said to him, I won't teach you my language. You're in Australia, learn English. So he was virtually fully Australian. Um, Uncle Dick, known as Sydney, John Husswaite, he, he was an Anzac in the First World War, Chinese Anzac, and he, he enlisted in Ballarat in 1915. And, um, yeah, he went over, over to, I think it was Egypt where they were, and then later went to, into France, and I think about 1919 eventually came back to Ballarat. And I just remember him, you know, when I was a small child, as being badly injured. So we do have a World War I hat badge, um, which, which was over in the house where Uncle Dick would have lived. We've only just um, dug it out recently and, you know, realised how significant it was. Samuel uh, was um, a very early student to go to Ballarat High School and uh, he was successful in gaining a place at Teachers College in Melbourne, the first Chinese uh, student to ever do so. Samuel Tongwei tried very hard to participate in World War I as an Australian serviceman, but the discrimination against uh, Chinese serving the armed forces started before World War I in 1909 when there was compulsory military training for all males in Australia between the ages of 12 and 26. Now, Sam was in the second year of uh, schooling at Ballarat High School when 
he was taken aside and told that he was not needed. He was quite upset, but in his understated way he said, I was the only one who wasn't in it. And he was determined, therefore, that he was going to be in it. I know that both Samuel and Headley were extremely keen to be accepted and they were knocked back twice, rejected. Um, and it was only the third time when um, it was near the end of the war and I think they were desperate at that stage for um, more to enlist and uh, their, their Chinese appearance worked against them initially uh, and that uh, made them feel very upset because, you see, they were born in Australia. They were Australians. Sam, first of all, had to um, explain his stand to his parents, who were not happy that he was going overseas to fight. And his father was partly, a, as, as a Christian minister, was a pacifist, did not believe in war. And Sam felt that they really didn't feel that Australia was home. He never talked to me about the war very much. But people would come and he'd talk to them and I'd listen, seeing I was a youngster and very curious. But he was probably like all the other young people at the time. They wanted to do their bit for Australia, seeing he was born here. So he, uh, he went to France. Uh, there was some prejudice against him. He was walking down the street one day and there was a, a drunk soldier said, what are you doing here, you Chinaman? And he went over and confronted him and said to him, what do you have to say to me? And the soldier just backed down. And a couple of other Australians were uh, quite happy with that. Thomas Albert Hughes, on his enlistment, uh, was, was quoted as the standard features. He was tall, he wasn't as dark as his other brothers, and he had on one of his arms tattooed Advance Australia. They were sappers, they were doing the digging of the tunnels and uh, I think it was very arduous uh, work and um, I think a lot of those wartime experiences weren't talked about because it was something that they didn't like to reflect on. He was injured in France. The the area was being shelled and they all ran for a shelter. It was a pretty big shelter but it was chopper block and he and another chap were in the entrance uh, and the shrapnel hit him in the back and the, and the hand and the other chap was dead. Uh, yeah, after fighting for a number of years he was eventually um, wounded in the right leg by machine gun fire and he was taken prisoner of war in Germany and then later repatriated and taken to the UK to recover and eventually arriving back home. Eventually died, I think, from his injuries. Probably for four months during 1916, which was at the time of the Battle of the Somme, where Australia suffered significant losses in battles there, particularly at Fromelles in July 1916. And he wrote quite a lot of postcards from France and also from England, sending them back to his two sisters. And uh, while he was in France, he experienced obviously some of, some of the direct effect of the war and some of these actually appeared in some of the postcards where the words that he's used, he's talked about the killing and the smells and the stench. And I'm surprised in some ways that some of that information was just written on postcards and sent back. So that some of them are quite emotional, and particularly when you put the groups of cars together to try and put a story together, which is what I'm gradually trying to do. They were both very proud that they had fought in the war and um, they were very proud of 
uh, the fact that they had a tree planted. And they both had their photograph taken um, by the tree and, uh, well, I think that that in itself makes its own statement. All the brothers obviously suffered from health issues, from going to war. After the war there was an instance of shell shock. He was teaching with his writing on the board when the headmaster came in and all the students stood up and knocked over some chairs and he had a bout of shell shock. After the war, well he certainly had an interest in either doing his duty I suppose and then he became a police constable and spent the next, the rest of his life as a policeman in New South Wales. We used to look at his hand and there was a big hole in the back of it and uh, used to ask him about that. So I had to learn to write left-handed. The interesting thing about Sam was that he decided very young that he was going to be Australian and he was going to assimilate. And he left behind, I think, a great deal of his Chinese background. Samuel was very, very proud of the fact that he was a member of the Australian Natives Association. And I remember even as an old man, when I went to visit him at Bendigo, he proudly took out the certificate and gave me a copy of his membership. Um, and he saw that as one of the significant achievements in his life. So it says something about Sam that the Australian Natives Association were so supportive of him and so appreciative of his efforts. Oh, the biggest team was formed by Dad talking to other ex-soldiers in Toowoomba and he managed to get a, about 12 players and they'd always turn up. Doesn't matter if they were sick or injured, but they'd turn up. Finding out about my Chinese ancestry was certainly an interesting exercise because we had talked to my father about the family history over a number of years and he was never interested in talking about the family history and said it was a waste of time and you might have better things to do. And there's a good chance that he possibly did know some of the Chinese history but refused to accept that situation where other parts of the family have embraced it with being that this is really something great. One of my sons, when he found out that uh, there was a Chinese link and Chinese Anzacs, his initial uh, answer was, that's terrific, is that another country I can go to without a visa? <laughs> yeah, well, my Chinese ancestry is uh, quite interesting. It has affected my life early on uh, when we went to school. All the children would uh, chai us a bit about Ching Chong Chinaman, but uh, after a couple of days, it all vanished, and I was uh, one of the boys. Yeah, I think the uh, the same thing happened to Hunter right through his life. When he'd go to school, he'd have the same problems. Then he'd go to grammar school, and uh, he had the same problems there. In the army, no doubt, he had it, but he seemed to be just part of the the team. And he said, well, two sides of a coin. I was Chinese and born in Australia, so it's both sides of the coin. Chinese, they came to Australia as a foreigner. They're looking for God, they're looking for their future. And the one who they stayed, they took on this country as their own country. And so they enlist and into the army. And uh, this is a great uh, contribution because uh, at that time, everybody knows if you enlist into an army, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't be able to come back to the to your home. So to me, and uh, this is a, uh, it's a great uh, turning point from becoming a foreigner coming into this con country looking for future, they actually become a part of this country.